right, welcome to it. UAP Studies Podcast. Very exciting guest today. Uh, I am Louis Borges. Joining me as always, uh, Jason Gilmet. How are you, my friend? I'm doing very good. It's very hot outside, so I apologize for people on YouTube. If you see me drenched, it's because it's really hot out. So you got to get a better makeup person. They can take care of that for you. Even me, I got a bit of shine. I should probably figure that out. <laughs> we but start anyway. getting to the point where we apply makeup. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't got there yet. Michael's got something for us. That's we'll what you it. need, man. National premier uh, oil blotting tissues. Oh, nice. There you go. Yeah, I'll nice. keep them right here. I'm, I'm, I'm a greasy, greasy person myself. So perfect. Speaking of greasy people, we want to <laughs> get back into the podcast topic and uh, welcome back to the show for a second time, uh, Mr. Michael P. Masters. Welcome, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today on this Sunday afternoon. Yeah, pleasure to have you back. And uh, so for a few of our uh, viewers and listeners that maybe don't know about your history and your past, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, obviously your education, and you know, you sort of shifted from one science world and kind of got into anthropology and everything else. So tell us a little bit about that progression and what brought it to where you are now. Um, yeah, well, my main area of study is uh, biological anthropology. I am a paleoanthropologist by trade, so studying hominin evolutionary anatomy, human variation. I have also participated in and run some archaeological digs in South Africa, France, Ohio, here in Montana. I have a field school that I run from time to time. Um, biomedicine, I guess, is sort of an area of recent research where I look at long-term evolutionary trends in our, our cranial facial anatomy and how uh, an increase in brain size and the frontal lobe moving out over the eyes in concomitant um, nature with uh, the mid and lower facial anatomy retracting backward, if that can impose itself on the eyes in some way and maybe help explain the, the increased frequency of juvenile onset myopia and astigmatism. So kind of dabble in a number of different things related to the field of anthropology. But um, yeah, I know in the back of my mind has always been this question, of uh, what are UFOs ever since I was an eight-year-old kid. And um, yeah, back in 2012, I decided to uh, write a book about it and specifically whether or not UFOs and aliens could be humans from the future, our, our descendants coming back through time to visit and study their own hominin evolutionary past in the same way that I do without time travel technology, obviously. And um, yeah, so sort of did a deep dive into that question uh, published a book called Identified Flying Objects in 2019 and uh, sort of laid a foundation, a multidisciplinary approach, drawing from anthropology, uh, obviously, and astrobiology, physics, and astronomy to just kind of make a case for this, um, look at some issues with the extraterrestrial hypothesis and um, just sort of see whether or not this could be reality um, in both our reality now and their future reality and for past peoples as well, going back through time. And then in, uh, let's see, 20, late, I guess, yeah, early 2020, I started writing another book, taking a different approach, um, focusing more on uh, abductions, contactee experiences, different contact modalities in the context of the same time travel model, but also um, other models to explain this phenomenon, the extraterrestrial hypothesis, uh, ultra terrestrial simulation, interdimensional and others. Um, just to sort of approach it from a different perspective and see, you know, just uh, what what works best, the most parsimonious explanation, essentially. This is great because on the podcast, we've covered many aspects, like if, you know, they're interdimensional, if they're extraterrestrial, but uh, the extra tempestrial uh, is something that we haven't really explored. And your book sort of opened me to that possibility as well, because you made some very valid points, some very good observations. Uh, you mentioned that, um, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that if somebody's in the future, they could go back about 50 to 40,000 years, and that's about as, as far back as they could go. But there's different points at which um, the interaction between humanoids and us uh, can happen. Uh, I, th I thought your book was fantastic when it comes down to uh, talking about the possibility that it's us from the future. Yeah, and, and that number uh, comes from a, a couple of different places. It, it seems like just based on 
the the way in which this time travel technology seemingly works and of course we're we're not quite there yet i do think it's going to be sooner than i'd previously thought when i wrote my first book i was kind of looking at it in the context of sort of the skinny bob i noticed you had skinny bob as your uh your your cover photo there but that that sort of quintessential big round head small face big eyes skinny body type thing um but then in researching this this most recent book i realized that it's probably going to happen sooner than later and we might be on the precipice of actually cracking the time code and it may even be happening now if you can um take into consideration uh david lewis anderson's research if He's, he's studied a number of things related to time. He claims that back in 2005, they were able to uh, modulate time so that they could speed it up by 300%. And uh, he said it's a, a factor of three or greater that they can do now. They've even moved people through time. So if we can take serious that research, we're already doing it. And a lot of the things he describes is oddly similar to the way I was uh, was sort of envisioning this happening as a non-physicist, but someone who's re researched the literature enough to sort of figure out how this might be taking place. And then you can combine that with uh, these actual craft. And if if the form of these craft does seem to indicate that they have the function of backward time travel, and, and that's not just a speculative thing at that point, because we may be observing what these things are actually doing in the future. So we get a glimpse of that future by investigating these, these machines. So it's more about connecting the dots rather than just saying, this is where we're going. This may be what we've already done. And if, uh, you know, the Roswell crash was a time machine, we've had 70 years to reverse engineer that technology. So we got kind of a head start in a bootstrap kind of way. Um, but also from, from Jim Penniston, uh, what he... Uh, divulged from his experience, uh, if we can take that seriously as well, that they have this upper limit of about 45 to 50,000 years. I think there was also, you'll probably know this better than me, but I saw um, something about a, a captured, I mean, this gets a little more out there on the edge, but um, a captured individual uh, that claims that they came from forget there was even a, a name for him there were two individuals and one was from I think 45,000 years ago they were like uh, J45 or something like that I don't know I came across it recently but it was yet another thing that that sort of indicated that this may be the upper limit however with that said um, that may just be the upper limit for these individuals and once we progress our technology farther uh, we may get to the point where we can come back from even farther and I think that might help explain the the very tall, uh, slender, highly cognizant, highly intelligent, tall grays that are described. I think they might be from an even more distant point in our future, but time will tell, I guess. When I uh, first started reading material on you and I heard you with that hypothesis that th they're probably us in the future coming back, or you know, it's, it's something to do with, we're way more connected than we think. Now, whether that's on a genetic level, we don't know, but to me, like I came into this field as a bit of a skeptic. And then the more I researched, the more it seemed plausible. And then the more brilliant people I speak with, now it's like I'm charged up about it, right? But that seems to make the most sense. Like as a non-expert, you know, if we evolve and if we were to wind up destroying our planet or polluting our genome or something, I mean, we've already, you know, fished out our oceans and forested half of the Amazon. I mean, it's just a matter of time. And, and again, this isn't a couple hundred years. So fast forward thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, who knows where we're going to be. So it would make sense that if we did go to another planet or something else to that effect, different gravity, that we would change, you know, as we would evolve, as you always say, you know, your head would get larger, maybe the shrinking jawline and everything else would have something to do with protruding eyes. It, it just seems to be the most plausible thing to me that it's either us coming back maybe to, you know, regain that history we've lost, or maybe there's a genetic component that maybe we can't reproduce in the future and we need things that are rich in stem cells or T cells, or, you know, a lot of these abducted uh, people that we've interviewed, they say that there was a lot of things to do with, you know, reproductive things, you know, the males yeah. had certain things taken and so did the women. Right. So yeah. to me that it does make the most sense that, that, you know, it could be us from the future going backwards. And it makes it way spookier because of that. <laughs> I think it's less spooky just because if it's from a different planet, like a, I included um, 
a case study of someone who's become a friend of mine who had been abducted since he was a young child and had been subjected to the anal probes and told me that after reading my book, he felt better about what had happened to him throughout his life because it, it was more like a, a visit to the doctor as opposed to these alien beings who came across the stars and kidnapped him and did all these things. So to him, at least, and it's probably different for everybody, but yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I think you're right. I mean, we're, we're, we seem way more connected than I think we would be if it was a separate evolution of a different um, course of life on a different planet, uh, somewhere else in the universe with a different distance from their sun, gravity, uh, coding system, most likely silicon versus carbon. There's a lot of other things that would go into their evolution that isn't likely to result in a human-like form but also at the same time. I mean, we're talking about billions of years, like four and a half billion years for the earth, 15 billion years almost for the age of the universe. What's the likelihood that at this exact moment, we would have these humanoid beings that are just slightly more evolved than us, physiologically, culturally, technologically. Um, and that was the thing that sort of led to this deep dive from the age of eight years old when I looked up and saw Whitley Strieber's book on the, the living room shelf is just that odd similarity and it, and it goes back even farther if you look at the fact that we're we're four limbed so are they uh tetrapods exist 400 million years in the past uh pentadactyly that we have five digits on each each limb and then obviously the the characteristics the fact that we're bipedal um is the trait that defines the hominin lineage going back six to eight million years and then, yeah, all of these characteristics of our craniofacial anatomy, which is mostly what I focus on and what my dissertation and current research is on, um, increased uh, encephalization, increased brain size, increased neurocranial globularity, the head getting more rounded, which is the trait that one of the traits that defines uh, anatomically modern Homo sapiens sapiens, our own subspecies, uh, facial retraction, uh, larger brains, larger eyes, those two things are connected ontologically and phylogenetically. So yeah, we look at all these characteristics and, and whether or not we live in space or underground, I don't think any of it matters, to be honest. They could very well still be living on Earth in the future and we would expect them to still have these more derived characteristics of the hominin lineage simply because they characterize the last six to eight million years, regardless of where we lived on this planet or um, what our social or political or economic system was like. They continued and I think they're they're likely to continue. and. And yeah, the, the more advanced culture, uh, I talk a lot in this most recent book about the, that genetic aspects. One of the most ubiquitous characteristics in these abduction accounts is, is sperm being taken from men, uh, eggs and gestating fetuses from women. And clearly there's something about reproduction that's very important to uh, whoever these are. But, but definitely, if they are future humans, it signals something that maybe went wrong or will go wrong with um, the way our reproduction works now in the future at some point. In your book, you mentioned how they have, or they show compassion towards the abductees uh, and that most of the time they have opposite uh, sex ambassadors, as you mentioned, uh, just the somebody that uh, would be current and ongoing uh, with all the abductions that it's the repeated character that they see all the time that sort of calms them down. Uh, if it's a male, it's a female ambassador. If it's a female, then male, obviously. Uh, but I thought that was interesting because that seems to be the case with some of the abductees that we talked to. Yeah, yeah. I mentioned that as well. That. Yeah, it's, had, it's uh... really weird. And, and, and that's, that was the whole um, point of this book was just to look for patterns like that. Yeah. Like I didn't, I didn't know that would come out. But um, yeah, I'm glad you sussed that out too, because it's this is the first time someone's mentioned it, but it was just one of these observations where you look at enough case studies and you start to see these patterns emerge. And, and it's interesting, you know, you got to ask why. Yeah. Why is that the case? Uh, it could easily be a, a female ambassador for a female abductee, but it, it seems to be the opposite for some reason. I don't really know why that is, but yeah, with these lifelong contactees, it's it's very common. There, there were, I would say, a, a very small percentage were actually the same gender um across cases so yeah that, i'm glad you noticed that in yeah terms no. of the phenomena do you think it's limited to like just as we've been speaking about you know potentially us in the future or is it that plus other civilized hominid forms you know like you said even everybody's picture of an alien seems to be similar right they do have two arms two legs 
whether the head's crazy big or small or, you know, three fingers, four fingers, they all, I mean, they're not squid and they're not, you know, birds. There have been some, you know, blue avians and that type of thing, I guess, bird related, but it just seems like for the most part, everybody's description of what creature they saw is somewhat humanoid, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, you have to acknowledge the psycho cultural hypothesis there and the potential psyop situation from project blue book where they're they're trying to put this out there so that when things are seen we can just say oh it's it's this thing that we saw on tv and i highlighted three cases in um in my most recent book that occurred before roswell that occurred before betty and barney hill where they don't have access to that that zeitgeist the the common uh stereotypical gray alien form yet but yeah, you're right. There, there is some variation. Um, I referenced a few times in this most recent book, the Dr. Grimitchell Free Study, where they uh, surveyed something like 3,500 contactees, abductees. And, and in those, the most common form was human. Um, and then you had the short grays, the tall grays, hybrids. And then only about 5% were non-hominin forms because all of those, hybrid, gray, tall, short, and ourselves, are all upright walking bipedal humans or hominins of some form. So, so if we can take that seriously, there is that outlier, that, that small percentage that we need to account for. And I, I don't know if this time travel model does, um, which would indicate to me that there is something else going on, whether it be interdimensional or possibly extraterrestrial. Um, but I, I do think the vast majority of cases and the UFO phenomenon as a whole does fit well with this model i mean we don't have evidence in the same way we we have developed the standards of evidence over you know hundreds of years of of scientific research so it's not going to be as reliable uh at least yet as uh you know many other fields of study but with with what we do have and if we can take these first-hand accounts seriously these eyewitness accounts and i think we should they would hold up in a court of law even if it's not uh, evidence in strict scientific terms, then, you know, patterns emerge and, and those patterns tell stories and the story seems to be a human story from what I can tell. You mentioned that there's droids as well. Like you mentioned, mm-hmm. you know, um, the Calvin Parker case where the droids came out and there's other incidences where there has been robot looking entities in the room. Uh, is that something that is just evolutionary? Like we're just bound to have robotic um help in the future and somehow is that important to time travel is that like you know are the grays only you know droids from the future where we might not have to have the risk of traveling through time we just send uh some entities back that uh, can do the job for us well um i think there's a few things going on there the the ones well first off i mean you look at um uh who's who's the big robot manufacturer can't think of their name right now it alludes me boston boston dynamics yeah boston dynamics they're they're making they're sort of leading the way in um human dog they make that weird dog thing too Uh, but robotics yeah yeah and you know there's a functional aspect to that like for carrying gear for soldiers or whatever but one of the main things they're working on and have been uh, along with uh, all of these other um robotics companies in japan and elsewhere is uh they they are trying to make a human form it's very very common for them to figure out bipedalism is harder with robotics obviously um but then to make something that looks human and acts human and um there's a show called humans actually where they they really dove deep into this it was a sci-fi show i think it was out of britain it's a good show um but it seems like no matter what I, I don't think that we're evolving into robots or that we'll start to integrate ourselves with them per se. I think what's happening here is that we're, we just got better at making human looking robots to the extent right. that to us uh, in the, the primitive past of these future descendants, we're not great at telling that it may be obvious to them. Um, but I, I think we can kind of confuse them because they got so good at it. With that said, the Parker Hickson abduction in Pascagoula, those were clearly robots. But right. both men say 
these were robots. They made buzzing sounds. They didn't look like humans. They like weird elephant skin and little triangle things. Yeah, they had head. horns out the side of their head. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so that's obviously a robot, a pretty primitive one in a way, other than the fact that it can hover. And interestingly, they saw humans on that ship. Again, not grays, but actual humans that look just yeah. like us. So it may indicate that that's from a more proximate period in our future. And they have this kind of clunky robot that can still levitate and stuff, but um, not necessarily human-like, not enough that you would, you know, marry it or, or uh, I don't know. There's a lot of movies about that too. What was that one? AI, I think it was. Yeah, the, yeah. Oh, uh, I haven't finished that movie. Yeah. yeah, the sex robots. I mean, that's probably driving the industry more than anything is people just can't get laid and want to have a robot girlfriend <laughs> or something. Just... <laughs> but to your point, uh, though, we interviewed Calvin Parker and he was, you know, speaking of things that have more of a humanoid form versus like a robot form. So yeah. he said, you know, when they put him on the examination table, this thing that looked like a pack of cards came out of the ceiling and kind of like scanned his head and went around one time and then disappeared. But he said that the, the creature that was beside him, he called her a female. So there's a very disti big distinction between that was a machine yeah. and this has a sex to it. Mm -hmm. Not only it's a living creature, but it was definitely a female one of whatever the hell it was. So. Yeah. And, and the same thing can be seen in Whitley Strieber's account. He describes four different types, one being sort of robotic, but humanoid enough that there was that crossover. And then, yeah, this this woman, this female, again, sort of the, the opposite gender thing happening. And uh, yeah, he, you know, it's hard because the, the female form was more toward this bug like insect like uh, type. And, and I don't think they are bugs. I don't think they're from like uh, him and I actually talked about this on his podcast, whether these insect or reptile like beings could be from a post-human future where they stumble upon our time travel technology long after we're dead and use it to go back a very, very long way into the past. And I, I, I don't know, it was just kind of a thought experiment that unfolded as we were talking, but um, it's an interesting idea. But I think these, these individuals are still human. They're just so far from our future that they've developed characteristics, and especially the large eyes, which seem to be the thing that people focus on the most. And that would be something that would likely characterize our very distant future. So, um, but it, he could still sense this gender aspect to this individual, whether it's a consciousness thing or whether there's a, a, a physical tell, I guess. Um, but yeah, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of questions there, but I do think the AI will play a part in the future. And like you said, Jason, I think it's going to be instrumental in helping us develop this technology because there's going to be risks involved with sending someone into the past they would just disappear right and if they don't come back and they're lost you know in time flying around on pterodactyls and whatnot you're going to have an issue with the ethics involved in that so sending a, a pre-programmed droid or, or some sort of ai into the past uh minimizes some of those risks to some extent I was actually surprised because you mentioned a bunch of stuff in your book that I had no uh, knowledge of. Uh, for instance, you were talk talking about, uh, t it was Terry Lovelace, right? Um, and you mentioned that the military sort of forced them to go under hypnosis. I didn't, I talked to Terry, but I didn't know that that happened, uh, that they forced him under hypnosis to sort of recount what happened to him, right? Kind of. That From what he describes in his first book, I haven't read a second one yet, it was more about just trying to find out if he had pictures because he liked to take photographs and they knew that and they were fine with him knowing they they gave him and his friend toby these pills to make them forget he didn't take them toby did messed him messed him up pretty bad uh, according to his account um but no it was really just to try to find out if there was any chance that he took pictures well being aboard this craft or on the moon base or wherever it was um and and they decided that he didn't so that he wasn't as much of a risk but it was it wasn't not so much to find out because what he says and uh peniston said the same thing is that they already knew everything they they've right. been doing this they've been interacting with these individuals whether they be extraterrestrial extra tempestrial for decades so it wasn't about finding things out they already knew everything they just wanted to make sure he wasn't a risk by uh, having some photographic evidence of what he saw. That's been ongoing for a long time. Uh, even talking to other investigators, just, you yeah. know, they're being followed and stuff like that and making sure they don't have information, but, um, yeah, I know. And it seems to be, I mentioned this in a, 
then in space.com interview, I was interviewed by a reporter from Al Arabi, which I think is a uh, broadcast in the Middle East and uh, North Africa. I think that's actually coming out next week. Um, but, you know, I, I've been saying the same thing because it seems obvious if you study these cases long enough that the Air Force has been involved in this since the beginning. Right. I mean, they, they were Project Grudge, they were Project Blue Book. They were there for the Roswell crash that may or may not have happened, but probably did. Um, and then, yeah, the Office of Special Investigations, specifically within the U.S. Air Force, they were the ones that were right there uh, investigating all of these cases with military personnel, Jim Penniston and Terry Lovelace being just two examples. But yeah, where are they in all of this? You know, I, I was yeah. asked about NASA. Who who cares? You know, <laughs> yeah, they, they're in space. They can see stuff happen around the Earth. Sweet. But let's talk to the people who have been studying this for the last 70 years. Where, where are they in this conversation? And it seems strange to me. Yeah. And others are saying the same thing, but and they're so they quiet. Involved, yeah, yeah. Until they get involved. I don't I don't I'm not even really paying attention to any of this. It's just a dog and pony show, in my opinion. The recent disclosures seem to be coming more from the Navy, right? Like with the Tic Tac incident. And we've had a few of those guys, you know, firsthand of witnesses on mm -hmm. the show. But yeah, the Air Force is um, almost it's spooky, right? Like, why are they not saying anything? Jason's always said this. It's suspicious. Uh, nobody knows aerial phenomenon better than trained observers and the best are in the Air Force. And yeah, absolutely. they should have at least some reports. You can't have none. Right. Or very like or, you know. I guess percentage wise, it might as well be none when you look at what's actually come out from all the different bodies. Uh, and, you know, Paul Hellyer was the Canadian uh, Ministry of Defense, and uh, he was big on getting this information out. So and he even admitted as the head of the friggin military of a country that there was stuff that he didn't have access to either that he found out secondhand. Yeah, I know. And it's easy to start getting kind of conspiracy theory ish when we start talking about these things. But I, I'm convinced now. I and, and it's funny, if I went back and watched my interviews over the last four years when I started talking about this stuff, um <laughs> my views have evolved significantly. You know, I, I I remember saying back in twenty nineteen people would ask me, Well, what do you do you think the government knows? And I'm like, I don't know, probably not. They and now it's it's very obvious to me that they do and have for a long time. And and yeah, there's probably even collaboration between us and, and our, our descendants from different periods in the future. It, it seems it's one of those patterns that seem to emerge from this research. And, uh, you know, it probably sounds crazy now, but in 20 years, it, it might be common knowledge too. I don't know. It's not one of those time will tell things, but um, yeah, it's, it, it's interesting to see what's happening now. It almost seems like they're kind of giving us just these little rungs in the ladder that will eventually lead to the Air Force giving us everything or, or you know, it, I've heard a lot of other people that that are in the know and especially ones in uh, government say that it's not up to them. It's right. up to these visitors when we know. And it seems like they're starting to inch us toward knowing, which is kind of exciting because, you know, the, this phenomenon's tens of thousands of years old. So being alive at the time when we might actually get to know about this and talk about it, meet them, it would be phenomenal. I think that would be awesome if that happened. And the fact that things have sort of been happening the way they have over the last, well, since 2017, essentially, seems to indicate that we we are on a path to, to knowing. And I think that would be delightful. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to the day what the Air Force actually comes up with a statement. But like you mentioned, they're quite quiet on the subject. Yeah. And my worry when they first came out with this uh, whole task force that they're going to have is that they were going to be competing with the people that have already been doing this for over 75 years. You know, these organizations that show up all of a sudden when an event happens, collect the evidence and then take off. You got this new task force now that's going to be you know, discovering that there's a group that's already doing this, right? Yeah. Uh, are they going to play ball or is it going to be, you know, the country sort of divided and compartmentalized with these different organizations, right? We're that's really at their question. mercy. Yeah, we're really at their mercy right now. Yeah, and I don't know. I mean, I guess we'll see, but I, and and do we even need them? You know, we, we know this is real. Do we need them to tell us it's real again or in a different way or another organization like right. and, and that's what's great about this this process and what's been happening is it's reducing the stigma regardless 
Um, and I think that that's the only thing I really pay attention to. Like, I don't watch the congressional hearings or whatever talking head is talking about something they don't know anything about at any given time. To me, what's really fascinating and actually worth noting is how the stigma is being reduced. And once that happens and has been happening, and if it continues to happen, who cares what, what these government officials that aren't involved say or no, we can get scientists involved, we can start studying this independently, the, the private sector, the public sector, and education can get involved. And, and to me, that that's more promising than what, whatever new Department of Defense branches sticking their nose into this at any given time. We had uh, Caroline Corey and her uh, movie crew on, uh, and they may come out with that movie, uh, A Tear in the Sky. And basically, they went to where the Tic Tac incident happened, which was off Catalina Island. Mm -hmm. And they just triangulated from three different vantage points and pointed all their instruments in the, in the air. And they had like a three or four day time frame to do this. And they started getting hits right away. So like you mentioned, we don't need the government to do this. Even people's cell phone cameras are far greater than anything that we had 50 years ago. So yeah, it and you may got not UA be a UAPX of too. They're, yeah, they're exactly. developing all these technologies. So yeah. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I think that that's uh, it's going to come from the public sector somehow, because that's the only way the government can really save face. They can't just say, yeah, we've known this for 80 years. We've been flat out lying about it. Right. So they're just going to kind of join the, the bandwagon. And when it starts rolling and say, you know, we're just as surprised as you guys. It's yeah. The only way they can save They'll face. sneak on that bandwagon, look around like, oh, what's yeah. going on? This is oh, cool. We forgot All to right. tell you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This oh, been yeah. This, for decades. this rings a bell, actually. There was this <laughs> thing in 1947. Now that you mention it. Yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I don't think they should get off that easy, to be honest. I mean, lying to the public, I get it. I understand why there's national security issues. There's this constant Red Queen battle of technology and warfare and whatnot. And, and people, you know, would have flipped their shit if they would have revealed yeah. this, whether extraterrestrial or future humans. We couldn't wrap our brains around that in the 1940s. So I get it. But I mean, come on, we're, we're not idiots now. I mean, I guess no. a lot of us are. And, and I don't think we were idiots then either. And I actually no. heard Stanton Friedman say years ago in an interview that's like, listen, we just came out of World War II where, you know, we pulled this off and, and we all came together and it was a cumulative win. So we could have probably handled some of that info, too. It was probably bad timing, you know, yeah. similar to Cold War and everything else. They don't want to bring that into the occasion, you know, as right. well as, oh, yeah, a nuke might rain from the sky. So I get, you know, you know um, teardrops in people kind of thing, right? Don't right. I mean, crazy. well, also, what was Orson Welles broadcast? Wasn't that just 38, right. 1938? So yeah. we weren't too far from that either, as far as uh, culture history goes. So yeah, I think I think you're right. The timing probably wasn't ideal. But then again, why did it take 70 years? Yeah. And, and maybe we're not even there yet. Maybe this is yet another false horizon. And we're it'll be another 70 years. But uh, again, I, I don't think it was up to us as modern humans, I think it's up to the future humans and they probably decided, you know, you just came off of this war, you're very primitive warring people. Uh, we can't trust you with this knowledge. You're yeah. as a society. Yes, there were very smart people, but as a society, I don't think that could have been divulged and people just suddenly wrap their heads around it. It's it's I think it's more complex than that. It's also the um, the fact that there's going to be some sort of accountability because there's many people that have had their lives wrecked because of the secrecy. You know, I, I'm a strong believer in Bob Lazar's story. I believe that they went in and tried to wreck his life uh, to discredit the guy, uh, you know, but there's other people. There's just got to be thousands of people that have signed NDAs that, you know, um, even with the new, was it Congress that passed that new, uh, law or uh, bill that anybody can come forward, even if they have an yeah. NDA to, to spill the beans about this. Like that's huge. Yeah. That's and then never the Navy did that back in what, 2020 or something where they changed their policy of the, so that pilots could report things without retribution. Uh, right. I think that's an important move. Yeah. What Congress just did is important too. And, and you know, how many people you're right, how many people did have their lives destroyed by the secrecy and this this cover up and, and it, it, it causes people to lose faith in the higher ups, the government, the powers that be, if, if you find out that this thing you think they're lying about, they actually were lying about. Yeah, you know, and then the next question is, well, what else are they lying about? And, you know, you, you look at 
how they, the CIA would test acid on people on, without their consent. They're, they're, it's, I don't know. It's got to be hard to govern people. I'm not saying there's any right or wrong way to do it, but it definitely uh, raises questions. And uh, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but when these things come out, it definitely makes yeah. you ask questions. And it's not even a political issue about left or right or whatever. It's just, I, I don't know. Is, is there some... Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying not to go down any crazy rabbit holes right now. Cause I, I probably don't even believe what I would say. It would just be wild speculation about whatever is going on or has been for the last 70 years. That's all we got to go you, on. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Jay. No, as no. you can say, I wanted to ask you as a historian and anthropologist, you know, you look at things as they were tens of thousands of years ago. So in terms of like ancient monoliths and ancient cultures and, um, hieroglyphs and things like that. People drawing pictures of spaceships and caves and, you know, uh, uh, structures that we weren't supposedly evolved enough to make, but yet they were made, right? Like the pyramids and all this stuff. So in terms of like the whole, maybe call it the ancient, uh, ancient alien theory or ancient astronaut theory, do you think there's any credence there? Like, were we able to build those giant monoliths or was there some yeah help no you... absolutely absolutely and i i do draw a hard line uh with the ancient aliens camp on this one because it and i i mentioned this in my my most recent book is is that they were absolutely capable of doing these things it doesn't take this grand technology to be able to carve blocks of stone and then stack them on top of each other and the fact that you have pyramid shapes in all of these different places is simply because that's a very solid structure that doesn't collapse on itself so they, it's just people through independent invention, um, discovering the best way to do things and, you know, the precision with which they can carve blocks really isn't, isn't that dramatic. Um, I think the most recent research indicates that they used water because water is always flat. So they would get these flat lines by using the, mm -hmm. the, the water line in order to carve those the same way consistently so that they would fit together. Well, um, so no, that, that, that's bullshit. I got to call bullshit on that one. I don't, I don't subscribe to that. It's also racist because it's never European things that couldn't have been built by those people. It's always the places where, you know, it's outside of Europe. So, so there's an underlying racial component to that too, that I think needs to be addressed, but no, and, and studying the evolution, not just of our physical form and our brains, but our culture, which is obviously derived from, or at least correlates with our brains throughout evolutionary history, you can see how we say that culture is cumulative it constantly builds on what came before so you have the starting point and then you as your generation builds on that the next generation builds on it and so on and so forth and you can see that 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 line that progressive line leading up to the people that built the pyramids or these monoliths or carvings in easter island or what have you so so no um i i think it's an overreach um and it it's something that it, it's good and bad i mean Ancient aliens definitely got a lot more people interested in the subject. Um, in fact, the, the most recent episode called The Time Benders was just entirely about this theory. They had me on for the end of it um, to kind of, you know, talk about the same things we're talking about, uh, the research in my, my two books. And I, I think they do a good job of exposing people to ideas, but it's also for entertainment. They have to entertain people and they, they go a little bit too far by just... Uh, alienating the gaps, as I say, instead of guiding the gaps, which we did throughout history when we didn't understand something, now they're alienating the gaps. And I, I think that's wow. somewhat harmful, especially in the context of really understanding the peoples of the past and their abilities and the technology that they had. I, I think it sells them short in many ways. Uh, as far as the tele uh, telepathy of these entities, do you think that's a, a technological advancement or is that going to be a biological thing that we're going to be eventually be able to do yeah i debated that in in my first book whether it's a brain-to-brain -brain interface thing some sort of computer interface or whether it's just an aspect of our consciousness um i i came to the conclusion in researching this that i don't think it is actually a machine implant or anything one, one thing that led me to that conclusion is the fact that you have uh, all of these individuals that don't have implants who are still communicating with these future humans, as I argue that they are, 
Um, so without that technology in our brains, how are we still able to do this? I, I, I do think it's an aspect of our mind, our consciousness. And I think our brain just facilitates that. There's sort of a growing consensus that our, our brains don't create consciousness, but it's more of an antenna that receives and transmits it. Um, so if that's the case, and, and we develop our brains to be a better receiver that can transmit information, uh, especially in sort of a pan-consciousness way that everything uh, is receiving and transmitting in this way, I think it's only a matter of time before that's just something that we can do. Uh, some people seemingly already have this ability. What's interesting is a lot of abductees or people who have these unexplained pregnancies that took place within their lineage seem to have that ability more, which indicates it's a heritable trait. Otherwise, they wouldn't be expected to have that characteristic as the descendants of these individuals whose grandmother was uh, mysteriously impregnated or something like that. And again, it sounds crazy to talk about, but you meet enough of these people and they have demonstrated psychic abilities or mediumship abilities. And you kind of have to start to pay attention to that after a while. And so, yeah, I do think it's an aspect of our brains, but not that our, our brains create this consciousness. They just get better at sending and receiving that information. And, and it may become a necessity at some point. We already have all kinds of problems because of our facial retraction which is the direct result of our, our brains growing larger and especially moving out over top of our eyes. Like I mentioned, it's not just vision in the functional sense that may be affected, but it's uh, also choking, sleep apnea, um, our dental crowding, all of these issues with our faces just not having the space and time in an ontological sense during growth and development to grow out and have the space that we had in our, our ancestors. And Obviously, one of the most important things, it's not just breathing and eating, but speaking is one of those. So if we're impacting all of these other functional characteristics that we trade off in exchange for larger, more complex brains, vocalized speech may be one of those. So uh, evolving our consciousness may not be why that happens, but it, it could be one of the things that allows us to, to expand our communicative abilities um, while still sacrificing the functional aspects of our, our lower facial anatomy. Right. It's essentially the basis of the, the Buddhist philosophy, right? There is this realm of consciousness you can access mm -hmm. through meditation and self betterment and everything else. And it becomes a very real way of accessing, receiving, transmitting all that, you know, the whole third eye and the lineage yeah. of, you know, history of cultures that believe in that, that there is some type of awakening, you know, it, it becomes spookier and, you know, weirder the deeper down the rabbit hole you go, right? It's more quantum physics and, and, you know, the Planck scale and that type of thing. But it, yeah. it makes sense now we're finding this as an evolved culture, but yet ancient religions have kind of believed in this for thousands of years. Yeah, it's true. And I think we're seeing somewhat of a bridge being formed between the East and the West uh, more recently, or at least with the people I've been hanging out with more recently, uh, scholars of religion and the history of philosophy and philosophy and history of religion, and philosophy or whatever combination of those things. Um, yeah, it seems that it, people have been talking about this in, in India and with, you know, Buddhism and Hinduism for centuries, thousands of years. And, and now a lot of those things are sort of being talked about more in Western uh, philosophy and in science. And you're right, maybe once we really start to understand quantum mechanics, we'll see that they're all kind of one and the same. Uh, it's easy to say that, you know, we can quantum mechanics the gaps in the same way that we got and alien the gaps, because it's something that we don't yet fully understand. So we can just throw it on anything. Um, but with that said, I, I do think there are discoveries related to particle physics and quantum mechanics that seem to indicate that there are things uh, that should be taken seriously that people had identified thousands of years earlier in, in a very different way, um, but through tapping into this, um, this potential realm that exists all around us that we just don't or didn't and still don't maybe have the technology to really quantify. I liked in the book how you talk about the time distortion from these crafts and that people in close proximity do experience time uh, differences, missing time. Um, you even talked about Peniston uh, at the Rendlesham uh, Forest incident. And uh, I didn't know that he had missing time. I discovered that from your book. I, I had no idea that he, like, I knew that he had seen the craft, but I didn't know that he was missing time. Uh, 
what causes that? Just briefly, I know it's a big, complex thing that you explained in your book, and I recommend everybody to, to read it because it's important. But what causes that dilation? Because some people you're mentioning were gone for 20 minutes. They come back, and it's about five days that they've been gone or seven days. Yeah, well, that, that one in particular that you just mentioned was Corporal Armando Valdez, uh, which is extremely hard to say when recorded in an audio book, as it turns out. Um, but yeah, he, he disappeared from his the, the rest of his platoon, six other men that were th there as he approached the craft uh, in their frame of reference for 15 minutes. But based on the time uh, and his watch, how dehydrated, malnourished he was, uh, bodily hair growth, he was gone for five days. So we have this uh, mechanistic indication of the time he was gone in the form of his, his wristwatch. But then also the physiological indication of of time uh, with the body hair and and the the weakness that he experienced through malnutrition. So um, that that's one example. Uh, I love how Jim Penniston described it as a sphere of influence. I thought that was a very poetic way of saying this. Um, but you see it in the Linda Jones case, which I talk about in my my most recent book as well. She was in Manchester and could actually see it. She could see the sphere of influence around it. And many other cases describe this as well. And I, I reference uh, Hal Putoff, who seems to be in the know uh, with many of these things. And he wrote a paper talking about how they manipulate the space-time metric. And uh, that a lot of this also correlates with Anderson's time research, where they're creating basically the sphere of influence around it, where within that time moves differently, they can speed it up and slow it down. And what's really interesting, one of the patterns that emerged from researching this book is you see both, you see time speeding up for some people and slowing down for others. So what um, Hal Putoff was was referencing is how there's a blue shift, and it helps explain the light. It helps explain the radiation burns because you have the visual light spectrum blue shifted up into the UV, UV spectrum, um, uh, X-ray even, which causes radiation burns, sometimes more severe. Oftentimes people will have burns and then start to recover from them and go on to live a long, happy life. Um, but he also says that that happens with time. They're uh, manipulating the space-time metric and within that frame of reference, they're speeding up or slowing down. And if there's this blue shift that happens, it's blue shifting time too. So that as people get close to these things, they might not actually be gone for three hours, but time speeds up within that frame of reference. So they emerge from it and they say, well, I'm missing time. And it's not because they were actually gone for that time or they just don't remember it, but it just sped up. But you have the opposite happen too. You have time slow down for certain individuals. So I think it's important to consider and also in the context of the g-forces which is a stumbling block and the you know the the love child of these debunkers and skeptics which is the stupidest thing ever i don't i don't see how we can take these people seriously and let them have a seat at the table they're they're anti-science they're basically the anti-vaxxers of the ufo community where they start Good from point. a place of bias <laughs> and say well i don't care what all the evidence is you're all wrong like, yeah. how is that scientific? That's the most anti-science thing ever. You're acknowledging your biases. This is where I'm coming from. Like, why, why do we give them a seat at the table? I don't, I still don't get it. But in any case, with the G-forces, um, it's it, it could be easily explained by this phenomenon as well, where what we see is this rapid acceleration, deceleration, right angle turns, the transmedium characteristics. And if they're manipulating the space-time metric within their sphere of influence, what we see is this instant acceleration and deceleration to them, maybe a 1G acceleration, deceleration, where they slow down the time around them so that we look like just very slow moving humans. And they're just going about their lives within this frame of reference. So we're shooting missiles at them. They, they see this thing coming at, you know, like this very slow speed. They have all day to yeah. react to that. But what we see outside their temporal frame of reference is something very, very fast. They're darting around like a fly on cocaine. And, and it's just, it's not that they're having to sustain or withstand these G forces. It's just a difference in the temporal frame of reference inside and outside of these craft. And to your point on the, the color shifting, I find that very interesting because now with James Webb telescope, it's getting way, way deeper views into the, get into the, you know, the universe and the, the most faint being the, the, dying red color right that's as far back as they can go because as long 
you know, space and time are correlated. So the actual color of that star equates to something. And you mentioned blue mm -hmm. shifting. We, when we interviewed George Knapp about uh, Skinwalker Ranch and he talks about these blue orbs and people reporting physiological ailments and burns and all this stuff as a result. So if it was just a shift in that scale, you would maybe affect time as well. Like I find that very interesting. That's a- Yeah, no, that's all hell put, put off. Your head into, right? Yeah, no, I, that's not that's not my idea. I'm just referencing him and his uh, paper. And then also he references Paul Hill, who wrote a book called, it's over here somewhere, Unconventional Flying Objects. Unconventional um, Flying Objects. Unconventional Flying Objects by Paul Hill. I think he was a physicist as well. But no, it, it makes a lot of damn sense. And, and the whole G-forces thing uh, was mentioned to me back in 2019 after the first time I was on coast to coast, someone who claimed to have been uh, an intelligence agent who is now retired, reached out to me and told me this G-forces thing that I'd never thought of. And I was like, you know, where were you three months ago before I published this book? Cause that's interesting information. Um, but then, yeah, like what put off argues, what Paul Hill argues, it, it makes a lot of sense. And if they do have the ability to manipulate space time, what's keeping them from going back in time. It, it really indicates that if they have this capability, why wouldn't they use it to go study their past, especially in the deep future, if everything's destroyed by war, which happens all the time, we're constantly destroying the culture of other peoples once we conquer them because we went to war with them because we constructed the other and said they're not worthy of existing. And so their culture isn't worthy of existing either. So we blow up all their shit and move on. And in doing that, we destroy the record. So it, a lot of people say, well, why would we go back in time if we have all of these digital archives and physical archives? Well, because we destroy each other's shit. You know, you might have right. to go back just to learn about the past because everything got blown up. Or if it's far enough in the future, not, not everything's going to survive even if we don't go to war with each other. So I think there's a lot of reasons for doing it, especially as an anthropologist, paleoanthropologist. I would love to have access to this technology and I would be doing the exact same things that people describe having been done to them in these abduction cases. So, um, yeah, a, a lot of things point to the fact that we figure it out and we use it to visit and study the past and possibly take gametes into the future to help with reproductive problems we're having. Nice. My last question for you before we let you go. Um, what about the threat narrative? Because we keep hearing about that, the threat narrative of this. Do you think that there's a threat to this? Because uh, Gary Nolan was recently uh, interviewed, I think, by Tucker Carlson, and he asked him, do you think that anybody's ever been injured purposefully by one of these objects? And he said, no. Um, people are getting injured from, you know, like you mentioned, radiation burns and all that. But uh, even what happened to Travis Walton, which you mentioned was more of a hospital uh, or emergency call, like a 911 yeah. call than anything else. Yeah, uh, he, he thinks that too. He also yeah. says that. Yeah. So um, do you think there's a threat narrative here or is that just something that the, the political system is using to sort of bring out disclosure? There is a threat narrative. I don't think there's actually a threat. Either okay. on either the individual level or the societal level or the military level. These right. things could have hurt us so long ago. They, they, totally they agree. have been flying circles around our technology for decades, centuries, and yeah. they still are. But it's it's stupid. It's so stupid. But I understand it. It makes sense in the context of needing an angle. And it this the threat narrative provides an angle with which they can get people on board who have always just turned a blind eye. They have this knee jerk reaction to anything involving UFOs. But if we say, well, wait, you know, what if we crash into one or they crash into us or they turn hostile? It's not gonna happen. Why would why would our descendants just start shooting people randomly or, or crashing right. uh, planes and aircraft carriers. It, 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 it makes no sense. And uh, if they are future humans, it also makes no sense if they're extraterrestrials because they could have done it a long time ago and hadn't. Um, so no, I get it. It makes sense. It feels a little manipulative, but w at this point, you know, whatever works, whatever keeps this conversation moving in the right direction, I'm, I'm on board. 
And what I like about the extra tempestrial model is that it also validates that the cattle mutilation might just be that they need a good barbecue every once in a while because they're human, right? So <laughs> maybe they just my, like the see eyes my new picture? and sex organs. I saw that. Yeah, that looks know? awesome. I just got that yesterday. Hang on, let's see if I can reach it. Yeah, I love this thing. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wait, I, I don't know where it's at. Um, Those poor cows. I know. Well, what's funny about it is this, you know, it's this cute little thing and that cow's about to get its eyes plucked out and its anus yeah. ripped out. You know? <laughs> and we're like, like, oh, cute. But it's such a happy little, I love it. No, my, my wife sells jewelry and she was at a, um, makes and sells jewelry. And we were at a, a arts festival yesterday and uh, the person right next door uh, painted this. I was like, oh, I got to get one of those. It's naturally, and, um, yeah. Yeah, it seemed, it's a synchronicity. Let's call it that. Uh, but yeah, I, I know it's kind of ironic in a way because that cow's about to undergo some very painful procedures. It's like Jason's picture in the background. Somebody commented once. They were like, you know, they may not all be friendly like your photo back there. And Jason's <laughs> like, no, no, they're holding the dude's arms down. They're not yeah, friendly in the picture. They're not either. friendly in that picture. <laughs> and, and that's, you know, that's an important point. Um, most people do have a positive experience. But yeah. Some some don't. You know, yeah. some are traumatized for life by what they endure but the vast majority especially ones that encounter the most human forms uh do do actually like it and and long for further interaction which seems weird to a lot of people because there's this threat narrative of aliens too but uh if you look at the statistics on that based on contact the experiences it's the opposite of what most people think Awesome. Louis, do you have any funny, yeah, uh, final Michael, questions? Yeah, Michael, where can people follow you and find your information? If they want to get more of your brilliant mind, where can they find you? Ooh. Other yeah. than somewhere in Montana. That cow is lashing back. It's fighting, <laughs> fighting for its life. The painting just collapsed on It's um, a sign. It is. <laughs> I know. You'll be all right. Um, so I think probably... I don't know. I, my website, I guess. I've got a website with an email list that I don't really use very often, so maybe that's not a good place. Um, I, I think I use Twitter more than anything else, just because it's it seems to be the place where most people are talking about this and in both informed and batshit crazy ways. <laughs> um, so, Which yeah, is a I don't great know. place to get in fights with people, too, apparently. Well, yep. yeah, I avoid all that. Uh, yeah. I, I run from those, like... Uh, a car on fire um but no like, all, i guess there's links to all those on my website and links to the books and um i, I recently designed I, I had a this um was my original logo because it's oh, kind of nice. how this thing started but then Evolution. i realized with the new yeah. book that doesn't work anymore so i made that little logo yep. like it putting on like t-shirts and stuff just, just to kind of have another way of getting the idea out there and there's a link to my Etsy page where I have those through the website too. So yeah, I guess the website is just michaelpmasters.com and there's links to all those other places that I just mentioned. Awesome. So the extra tempestrial model is the newest book by Dr. Michael Paul Masters. I definitely recommend this book for everybody because this is an aspect of, um, you know, studying UAPs that is very important. We need to look at this angle as well. It's brilliantly written. Like I said, I'm not just, uh, you know, praising it because you're on the show. I actually <laughs> love the show. Uh, the, love the, the book. It was really well uh, done. You can also get the audio version as well on Audible, uh, which is the way that I uh, listen Listen to the uh, the book, which is read and uh, by the author himself, actually. So Terry, uh, Terry, Michael, I appreciate your time. I got Terry Lovelace stuck in my mind. Uh, <laughs> it's easy to do. Is, I've always got him it? on my mind as well. Yeah, his story now is uh, I'm going to have to go back and, and reread the book. Uh, Michael, <laughs> I appreciate your time, sir. I appreciate everything that you're doing within the scientific community and talking about this subject. I know these podcasts sometimes are a little bit tedious, but uh, your voice is, is, is refreshing in the community and we need more people like you. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Yeah, that's awesome. I appreciate that. And um, always a pleasure talking to you fellas. So thanks for having me. <laughs>